Hello again everybody and welcome back. In this video, the fourth video in our five part uh, car, car counting series uh, using OpenCV and Visual Basic, we're going to uh, combine essentially the three previous programs that we did and add some additional steps and that's going to allow us to perform multiple object tracking by image subtraction. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into it. So we'll go ahead and fire up Visual Studio and then we're going to go to G-I-T-H-U-B-M-I-C-R-O and I will link this in the description below but here's another way to get there. Take out the spaces and then we can go to here and there's Visual Studio. Go ahead and close out the splash screen and then go to repositories and then we're going to go to multiple object tracking by image subtraction visual basic and we're going to go ahead and choose that and we're going to find um, four files in here the readme which isn't especially important that's just going to end up saying referring to the video when i'm done recording the video and we have the avi file which is the same as in parts one and two and that's uh, simply this avi of people walking around uh, looks like a college campus um, that is provided with opencv and i've simply copied it here into this repository for convenience but you can also get it from the opencv sample directory and then we have our Bob blob class and then our four main so let's go ahead and start building up the project so we can go to here file new project and we're going to choose visual basic windows forms application and, whoops, okay, it says the path is too long there we go uh, open the multiple object by image subtraction. Maybe we'll just choose this to VB to make it a little bit shorter. Multiple object tracking by image subtraction VB, and we'll put it in our usual uh, location. Uncheck those and choose OK. And then we're going to go ahead and set up our references. And please see the installation tutorial. Um, I will link in the description below if you're unclear on any of these steps as far as how to set up the references. So let's go ahead and name, rename the form first. So FRM main. And yes, that's please update all references. And then we're going to go ahead and start it. And we always get this error because there's one reference that doesn't automatically update. And so we're simply going to change this to .frm main and there we go and now the program should start and run although it won't do anything yet but that's okay so let's go ahead and verify that and there we go there's our program starting and running there's our form so let's do our references next so we're going to go up here to uh, configuration manager and then new and then x64 any cpu create new solution platforms and close that now says x64 so now we're going to go to uh, project add reference and then we're going to go to browse and then we're going to add these DLLs those four we're using mgocv 3.1 here and then go ahead and choose add and then OK and then we're going to go to project and add existing item and I'm going to copy and paste this path here out of the cheat sheet so we're going to go to that location and then we're going to go to all files and view all files that is and then we're going to choose those four and choose add and then we're going to choose those four there and go to properties and then copy to output directory copy always and save and now we're going to start copying and pasting in code so let's do blob first so if we go to raw and then we go up here to project uh, add new item and then we're going to add a class when it asks us. There we go. So we'll call this blob, B-L-O-B dot V-B. And we can just copy and paste in all the code from uh, the GitHub repository. And then we're going to go back to our design view. Right click on the form, go to view code. And just jockey these things around at the top here a little bit. And then we're going to add some spaces here to give ourselves some room to work. And now we're simply going to go back to the GitHub repository and we're going to work our way through implementing main.vb here and we're going to go to raw so it's easier to copy and paste out of. So we'll start by copying and pasting all of these uh, comments here at the top. And then we're going to add these components to our form and build that up. And I think I'm going to fast forward through this because this form is essentially identical to the form in parts one and two. Um, so please refer to that section, uh, to those videos rather, um, if you have not already. Okay, so now our form's all set, so the next step is to set up our events here. So let's see, we have form closing and then button open file click. So if we verify that we've named the button, which I'm pretty sure we did, button open file, so we can go ahead and double click on that. And let's add some spaces here. And we can take these spaces out and then add a few more here. And then we're going to go back to the form design, click anywhere on the form, go to the lightning bolt, and then we're going to look for 
form closing, which is right there, and then we're going to move that back up to there. And now it's just a matter of copying and pasting in the code that isn't there already. So we're going to go ahead and paste in our member variable section right there. And we don't need these blank spaces. And then we're going to paste in the body of form closing. So that's going to go right there. And then we're going to paste in this additional comment line here and take out that extra space. And then we're going to highlight all of the body of button open file click. And there we go. And that's going to go right there. And then we have track blobs and update GUI to paste in. And I believe that's it. Well, a few other helper functions as well. So we can copy and paste in all of those at the bottom here. And then we can close out of that. And we're going to use the um, same video as in the first two parts of the series, which is that um, video that AVI file which ships with uh, OpenCV. So let's just do a final scroll up here, make sure we don't have any red lines. Okay, it looks like we're all set. So now we can go ahead and fire it up. And let's go ahead and maximize that and choose Open File. And then we're going to go back to uh, this AVI file here. So go ahead and double click on that. And let's take a look at some of our th uh, pre-processing steps here. So here we have threshold. Uh, here's our threshold and image, and then we have our contours image, and then we have our convex holes, and then we have our current frame blobs, and then we have our blobs. And I'm going to explain the difference between current frame blobs and blobs in a moment, but let's also take a look at the um, finished video file as well. So uh, what, what we're doing here that's different than previously is the idea is we're trying to track uh, each person across frames rather than just identifying that there's a blob there. So these two people who were close to each other at the bottom, for example, uh, let's go ahead and start over actually, that may be a better example. So these two people here that are one blob because they're right next to each other is three, this person here is five all the way until they're accidentally updated to 12. Um, so ideally the, the index of the person should not change as they move across the screen. But we're using a relatively basic algorithm here and this is really sort of more of a test bed um, for more advanced algorithms that you could move into as far as object tracking, which of course is a big area of study in computer vision. Uh, and there are many different, more advanced ways to do this. So rather than get into too much detail, I figured let's just get a basic version working first. And then in the next project, we're going to tailor uh, this specifically to car counting. But before we jump onto that, let's take a quick look at the code. And this isn't going to be too dissimilar from the second project, except for we add our function to match the current frame blobs to the blobs that already exist. So uh, this part here is pretty much the same as previously. We simply open the image, do some basic error checking, then we call track blobs and up, update GUI. So here we read our two frames, uh, jump into our infinite while loop, and then uh, here we perform our basic same pre-processing steps, we get a copy of frame 1 and 2, declare a difference in threshold images, convert to grayscale, Gaussian blur, call abstiff to get the absolute difference between the two frames, then we threshold, then we perform our morphological operations, and just experimentally I found that two dilates in an erode each with a 5x5 five five window seem to work the best. Uh, then we find contours, and then we get our convex holes from our contours uh, here, and we have the separate draw um, and show contours uh, function here so that we don't have to put the additional steps to show uh, contours, then show convex holes, then show blobs, etc. Each time we can simply call this function here to take care of it in one line neatly. And then we step through uh, the convex holes and supposing they meet this criteria, we add them to our current frame blobs. And then here's where the program gets uh, different than what we've done previously, is if we're simply in the first frame, of uh, the video, then all the blobs are new, so we're going to add all of the current frame blobs to uh, blobs. Once we're past the first frame, what we have to do is we have to match the blobs from the current frame to the blobs from the previous frames that we've been tracking. So I made a slide to attempt to try to explain this a little bit better. So for example, let's say uh, we've got three blobs that we're tracking. So let's say this is a one blob, and then the dash box represents a predicted next position, and then this is another blob, and then we can use our prediction algorithm from the previous program to predict these positions, and, and we'll get at least a pretty accurate result. So then here's our third blob at the bottom. So then let's say in the next frame, we get this. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, if we overlay them, what we'll find is that 
um, what we're going to do in, in code here, but I'll just kind of explain it verbally first, is for each of the uh, current frame blobs, which again are the blue circles here, um, they're actually, of course, um, contours or more specifically convex holes in the program and then we can draw a bounding rect around them but in this sort of just simplified graphical example I've drawn the blobs as circles so if the blue uh, circle here is the current frame blob so then what we're going to do is from each blue circle so starting with this one for example we're going to compute the distance to the center of each of the predicted ones so in other words this distance here then we're going to compute this distance here then we're going to compute this distance here. Then we're going to figure the least of those three distances, which obviously in this case is going to be this one. And then we're going to determine if is that distance low enough that it meets our threshold standard of, okay, that actually was a match with the predicted one. So let's go ahead and look at that in code. So that's what this function match current blobs, match current frame blobs to existing blobs is going to do. So here we jump in and we're going to iterate through existing blobs and so by default we're going to have the assumption that current match found or new blob for each existing blob is false. So in other words we're going to suppose we haven't found a, mat a match until we do. And then for each existing blob we're also going to call our prediction function which again we took a look at in the previous uh, video. So now we're going to iterate through current frame blobs. That's our outer for loop. And then our inner for loop is iterating through each of the existing blobs. And then we're going to look for those matching distances that we mentioned uh, just a moment ago in the slide. And then here's, um, once we find the least distance for each of those potential matches, then we, we're going to check is that least distance less than our acceptable standard, which just experimentally I found to be if we do the current frame blobs diagonal size times 1.15, that worked out pretty well for a least standard distance to constitute a match. And if that match did occur, then we're going to add the current frame blob to our existing blobs. If that match did not occur, so for example, if one of the blue blobs, if one came in, say, up here, so it wasn't, or maybe down here, so it wasn't even close to any of the three predictions, then we would say at that point, it must be a new blob that just entered the screen because it's not anywhere near matching any of the other predictions. So at that point, we would add a new blob. Now the other thing we have to consider is what happens when a blob moves off the screen. And that's what this next code handles. So we're going to, at the end of this function here, iterate through existing blobs. And we're going to uh, check if in the current frame uh, we found a match. And if we did not, we're going to increment the number of consecutive frames without a match by one. And then we're going to check is that number greater than or equal to five. And if for that blob it has been uh, has reached a point where it's greater than or equal to 5, at that point we're going to suppose that that blob has moved off the edge of the screen and we can't track it anymore. So we're going to say still being tracked is assigned false. And that's really the meat of the program there. The rest of the functions are essentially just helper functions. We have add blob to existing blobs, add new blob, distance, betw distance between points, which is just the Pythagorean theorem, and then these two functions, depending on whether you're passing in contours or blobs, to draw the contours or the contours of the blobs. And then we have a final function here simply to just go through the mechanics of drawing the blob info on the image. So that was the bounding rectangle and the blob uh, index number that you saw on the screen. So um, that completes this program. Um, there definitely is uh, much further literature out there to uh, greatly refine um, the this type of tracking algorithm. And this paper in particular is one that I found and is very interesting, discrete uh, continuous optimization for multi-target tracking. And in fact, this is uh, such a good paper that um, it's worth taking a look at. There's an associated YouTube video for it. And you're going to see that they um, actually, which is kind of interesting because they use the same, I have to remember to turn off the sound here, they use the same um, video that uh, we're using today that ships with OpenCV. And uh, let's see here, um, the player's just a little bit slow, bear with YouTube, there we go. So as you can see, if you have a really, really outstanding, you know, top grade level algorithm here, you can get extremely good results, uh, even in a very difficult video such as this where there's constantly a lot of overlaps. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you're working with a more specific situation like car counting, you can do some particular things to tailor um, your algorithm to that situation, which is what we're going to take a look at in the next video. So I'll go ahead and stop recording this video at this time, and then I'll see everybody in the uh, next video, which is going to be the finale car counting video.